I am Keita Takayama of uh, Kyoto University Graduate School of Education. Uh, we have started this program towards critical, historical, and transnational dialogues on Japanese model of education uh, since uh, July of last year with our webinar series. And we have heard from eight speakers, and including uh, Dr. Kitamura, who is speaking today. Uh, we had nine sessions, and uh, we had diverse diverse uh, speakers, uh, two from the United States, one from South Korea, and uh, six researchers from Japan, including Dr. Kitamura, who is speaking today. We have discussed diverse topics, and in starting with uh, the history 100 years ago, uh, speak, uh, speaking on the topic of Japanese-style education uh, carried out at the Japanese-Americans internment camp, and uh, we also discussed the uh, Japanese-style education, which was brought into South America by the immigrants uh, from Japan. After which, uh, we also talked about uh, the colonial uh, days uh, in South in Korea and uh, Taiwan, and how education was carried out there. And uh, we also talked about the peace movement and Esperanto movement in the 1960s, also discussing the daily life writing which uh, Japan decided to spread to the world. And uh, more recently, uh, we discussed uh, uh, Sato Manabu's uh, learning community concept and how it was spread to the rest of the world. And we also talked about the lesson study experimentation carried out in the United States in the poor urban cities. Uh, Chicago and San Francisco cases were discussed. We also had a session on Tokkatsu carried out in Indonesia, Malaysia, and also more recently in Egypt, uh, which is uh, being carried out on a more larger scale. And therefore, we have covered uh, diverse topics. And of course, so uh, we haven't learned so much, perhaps. But in all of these cases, uh, we discussed uh, who were the proponents of uh, spreading of the Japanese uh, education in these uh, cases and how they have been carried out, historically speaking. And in those uh, processes, what happened to so-called Japanese-style education? Uh, what were the choices that were made and uh, recontextualization that took place? Who were the local proponents uh, who tried to introduce Japanese-style education? And what sort of expectations or hope did they have towards Japanese-style education? The provider and the recipient of uh, Japanese-style education was discussed. And also, what were the impacts both on both ends of this transnational experience? What or how did the Japanese-style education change in the meantime? These were the kind of things that we discussed throughout the webinar series. The purpose of having the webinar series is to take a more historical, longer span perspective on exporting of Japanese-style education, which is carried out today, and more specifically, by MEXT in the form of EDUPORT. We wanted to review what has been done in the past. And that has been the purpose of holding this webinar. And this is the final program for this academic year. And we will be inviting Dr. Kitamura later on, who has engaged, been engaging uh, deeply with uh, Eduport as the final speaker. He is, so to speak, the last and most important performer, so to speak, in a song program, perhaps. By the way, uh, this is the ninth program. Is there anyone who attended all nine sessions? Of course, uh, I did as a facilitator, but apart from Kyoto University members, was there anyone who attended all nine sessions? Please uh, 
write that up in the chat uh, if you did uh, or you are attending uh, all sessions. Uh, generally speaking, uh, 70 to 280 people have signed up uh, for each of the sessions. And 10%, uh, 15% uh, of them may not be able to join on that particular day. But I think uh, more or less we had a good turnout. And uh, from April onward, for academic year 2021, we would like to also uh, start a no new webinar series on a different uh, theme and topic. And uh, we hope to start either in May or June. Regarding Dr. Kitamura, uh, he is uh, with the uh, Graduate School of Education of University of Tokyo, and uh, he will be discussing uh, borrowing and lending of educational models uh, through international cooperation, cases of Japan's efforts to promote knowledge diplomacy. That is his title. As for uh, Dr. Kitamura, he is serving as the, the member of the steering committee of Edge Board of Mext. Uh, he is chairing the secretariat and uh, he has uh, been um, working on Edge Board uh, right from the beginning. And as a researcher of international development education, uh, he has uh, committed himself actively on overseas dissemination of uh, Mext, uh, Mext overseas dissemination of Japanese style education. Our global office has also uh, been involved with Edgeport. And uh, we have been conducting research on Edgeport. And in May last year, uh, we applied uh, for working on the study and the research on Edgeport, and uh, we have uh, been working on the report to be provided on Edgeport up to quite recently, and uh, I'm still quite tired and exhausted from that work. And uh, uh, Professor Taeko Okizo of Otsuma Women's and uh, Professor Aki Yonehara of Toyo University, these uh, uh, two um, capable uh, women leaders in this field uh, have uh, worked on this together with our staff at the global office. And uh, probably this report uh, will uh, be uh, made a public uh, perhaps in April or so uh, on the Edu uh, Board website. As a matter of fact, uh, last week there was an opportunity to uh, have hold uh, the Ediporter Symposium in on um, Tuesday last week to discuss the results uh, over the past five years uh, and uh, uh, to think about the future of Ediport. And I have met uh, Dr. Kidamura on that occasion. Uh, Dr. Kidamura is working to promote the project of Ediport and he has been doing so for the past five years. As for myself, from about June of last year, I have uh, been looking at Edgeport uh, as a topic to be studied and researched. And uh, therefore, I hope I look very much forward to speaking uh, with him today. Because uh, in the symposium that I have already mentioned, he was serving as a facilitator and uh, he was asking for our comments, and uh, he did not have so much time to speak uh, from himself. And therefore, I look very much forward to listening to what he has to say on this subject. The report that we submitted uh, is uh, about 300 pages. Perhaps uh, Dr. Kitamura has had a chance to look at that report. Uh, I look forward to his comments, if he has done so. As for Dr. Kitamura, I have the impression that he's a very, very busy person indeed. I have uh, visited him uh, at the University of Tokyo uh, at his office several times. Uh, he's never in the office. He's always out of office. And uh, he's involved in so many projects uh, and uh, engagement. 
And uh, that is why he is not in his office. Uh, he works for the UNESCO National Committee. He works uh, for the uh, Board of Education of Tokyo Metropolitan Government, Education Rebuilding Council, UBAN University, uh, Royal Phnom Penh University, and uh, also uh, for various uh, ASEAN organizations. He is serving on board of various uh, societies and foundations. As for the symposium, which was held uh, last week on Egyport, uh, he came rushing into the speaker's uh, waiting room. He was a final person to rush into the waiting room, looking very busy. Uh, he just made it on time. And uh, he reminded me of uh, this situation comedy in the United States, this Seinfeld and uh, the character Kramer. Uh, he always rushed in the door, through the door, uh, when he uh, arrived, and therefore he reminded me indeed of that character Kramer. And I'm so grateful that uh, he accepted to speak to us on, in spite of that very busy schedule. And then, uh, Dr. Kitamura, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kitamura with Tokyo University. Uh, Professor Takayama, thank you very much for your very generous and kind introduction in the beginning. I've been involved in so many things and uh, involvements, and I have caused trouble on many people, but um, I have been trying to think how theory can be related or translated into practice. Uh, and I'm so grateful that we have been given this opportunity and uh, to speak in front of you and like to thank the uh, Kyoto University School of Education, Global Education Office. And uh, this may sound like the uh, last thank you words, but actually, uh, that is not the case. I don't want to make you angry. And uh, please allow me to begin my presentation. Uh, so today, uh, as I share my screen. I hope you can see this. Um, uh, the title of my presentation is Borrowing and Lending of Educational Models Through International Cooperation, Cases of Japan's Efforts to Promote Knowledge Diplomacy. As has, has been mentioned, my uh, area of specialty is international education development, especially in developing countries, how education can be developed. In the third world, how can we raise access to education opportunities or quality of education in those countries? And that has been what I have been studying and also have been involved in various uh, practices together with international organizations and a aid organization like JICA. As has been mentioned, uh, for Edgeport, a project by Minister of Education of Japan, uh, I have been engaged in the preparatory stage for quite many years now. And in the very beginning, the Japanese style education and many people doubt that it might be whether it's a good idea to try to export. Japanese style education, and when I have spoken in various seminars, some may be concerned that it shouldn't uh, lead to a cultural imperialism, and of course that shouldn't happen. In my understanding, Asia-Port Japan is not a hard sell of our educational model, rather we would like to share our practices with other countries and also we like to learn uh, in that process from other countries so we should be on equal uh, footing and in promoting knowledge diplomacy Asiaport Japan I thought could play a very important role in promoting uh, knowledge diplomacy so knowledge diplomacy uh, is a keyword as I put it in the subtitle of my presentation title and as I have been engaged in education issues in developing countries, international education cooperation 
one type of international cooperation. I think will make you remember that education cooperation is from developed countries to developing countries. So developed countries supporting developing countries in their efforts to enhance education. And through such international cooperation in education, I have had some experience myself. And Asia-Port Japan、uh, is not limited to developing countries as partner countries, but in many cases, developing countries or、uh, middle Level countries or countries in transition from developing to develop the countries, which are still in the stage of economic development, have been the main partners of Asia Port Japan. So, in that sense,、uh, the essence or features of international assistance cooperation、uh, is more or less、uh, prominent. Why do I need to? Speak about those points.、Uh, let me begin my talk with that question in mind. Why is it necessary for us to develop a new education model through ways such as Educo Japan? And that is not an endeavor limited to Japan,、uh, Finland, or Singapore. Are also engaged in their search and development. Of a new education model, they have been developing their education model and have offered their models to other countries actively. So it's not only Japan. In some cases, we see a kind of a, a business efforts out of this. For one thing, there are countries. Which would like to receive such an education model? I will not go through those bullet points, but basically, education, or rather, society is changing dramatically, and the speed of change is so fast. In that environment, the traditional education learning style. May not work. The kind of skills which are necessary today have become complicated. In that circumstances, in any country or in any society, they also face a challenge of lifelong learning, where、uh, learners would like to develop their skills and. Competences fully, and so many countries and societies would like to learn from the efforts of education in other countries to learn from them, and there I think is a need for advancing an education model, and so. Professor Takayama mentioned such an effort has been underway for a hundred years or so, and actually, although I said that we are living in a new era, but such learning of education practices is not new. For many years, that has been conducted in various countries. Professor Takayama and I myself have also been studying comparative education. And that is my area of、uh, specialty, and in the discipline of、uh, comparative education、uh, studies, we, of course, refer to education models in different countries. In the mid nineteenth century, a French scholar, Marc Antoine Jurien, emerged as a founder of. Comparative education as a new academic discipline, but not just Durian, but many other predecessors looked for a 
education model to improve their own country's education model and learn from other countries. Why did such efforts become active in the 19th century? For one thing, in the 19th century, uh, with the French Revolution, uh, modern states were formed and they began to make efforts to educate people at large, not just nobles and the religious leaders who more or less、uh, monopolized power, but citizens in a republic nation states had to play a very important role as citizens and there emerged the importance of public education and there was a need in those countries, modern states, to develop a education system to educate citizens at large. And educational borrowing, which is to borrow an educational model from other countries, is one effort. In borrowing education models, to use an educational model as it is doesn't happen usually. Usually, there has to be effort to adopt someone else's educational model to their own, own context, but in certain cases, some may have opted for appropriation. And from the 19th century to the 20th century, adaptation that is to bring an education model as it was was often done. For instance, from a suzerain Western powers to a Colonized country in educational model was transplanted. In such a case, a suzerain state, often the case, imposed their educational model on colonies. On the other hand, after that period, appropriation took place. That is to localize an educational model. To suit the local context. And such appropriation has been a very important effort, especially for Edgeport Enterprise. But before I speak of、uh, Edgeport Japan, I would like to speak of some important agenda from the viewpoint of、uh, comparative education studies. So first I'd like to speak a bit about Comparative education studies and also some important concepts. In comparative education studies, especially from the mid 20th century, the world has changed dramatically. And since 1990s, after the demise of the Cold War structure, the whole world has been thrown into chaos. And in academia, various、uh, Approaches have been underway and comparative educators or comparative education scholars have tried to review、uh, what has been done and how it has to be done.、Uh, and one important question they have been faced with is the independence of comparative education research as an academic discipline. Often the case, comparative education studies or comparative education Scholars、uh, have been looked at as someone who、uh, is useful when somebody else wants to know about the situation in other countries. But how can we establish this particular academic field as one independent academic discipline, not just that, as a tool of somebody else? In comparative education studies, education、uh, borrowing 
has been an effort since the very beginning. Uh, for instance, transporting educational models to uh, developing countries. Uh, but then, uh, from 1950s, many countries became independent, not colonies any further. When that era began, educational lending became another important aspect. Uh, so there was relationship between borrower and lender. And in the case of education borrowing, somebody who had more power, more or less uh, hard sold. But in educational lending through the framework of international cooperation, education model was more or less lended. But in such an educational lending, often the case we don't see an equal relationship between the lender and borrower. And educational borrowing and educational lending have been very important issues to study deeply in comparative education studies. And one a concept I found very useful is uh, knowledge diplomacy. Cultural, it, it's not a cultural imperialism, but in a relationship on an equal footing, and not in a way to compete for supremacy, knowledge diplomacy can be used. And knowledge diplomacy or diplomacy is how uh, can we promote both cooperation and sound competition? In applying a Japanese model to another country, we might be able to construct a, a good relationship with each other. When we think of knowledge diplomacy, uh, since the 1990s, in the discipline of international relationship, knowledge diplomacy as a concept was discussed, but not much in the discipline of comparative education. Uh, John Nye in Toronto University, a well-known scholar internationally, and as far as I know, in the field of education studies, he is the very first person who brought the concept of knowledge diplomacy into the field of education. And I was uh, uh, doing a joint research with her around that time, and I was inspired by her. And I began to be really interested uh, in the use of this concept, knowledge diplomacy. What is the purpose of knowledge diplomacy then? Education sector is becoming globalized. In other words, education practice and systems in a certain country cannot be sustained at its worst. Uh, rather, through a interaction with other countries, they can be further enhanced, or out of a natural uh, course of people uh, moving from one country to another, sharing knowledge. Often the case has to be carried out whether we like it or not, beyond the national boundaries. And internationalizing education may lead to an international peace, although this may sound like too idealistic. With the enhancement of education around the world, international society may become more mature, and in that sense, education 
it could be very useful, and knowledge diplomacy can be used as a way to promote education sharing. And、uh, Professor Knight, Jane Knight of Toronto University,、uh, think of four. Aspects of knowledge diplomacy.、Uh, there are education, research, innovation and application, and also culture. And she is a specialist on higher education and knowledge diplomacy. I think、uh, is most active in a higher education. Besides higher education, there are primary and secondary education, and special needs education, and so forth. And among them, international, internationally, higher education is most active、uh, in uh, uh, the activities going beyond all boundaries, national boundaries. So I think、uh, higher education sector、uh, is the part of education、uh, areas where. Knowledge diplomacy is most active, and so students and scholars、uh, play a role of cultural dip- diplomats in a sense. And we, when we think of、uh, knowledge diplomacy, one concept which is very useful is the concept of soft power, advocated by Joseph Nye of Harvard University.、Uh, in comparison to hard power, which is、uh, Military power. He proposes that soft power is also important, and、uh, he proposes that soft power, or smart power, are important. And his theory of power、uh, is very influential around the world. And I myself would like to take a certain challenge on his concept, even if he. Call it a soft power. After all, it's a matter of power. When we continue to discuss power, at the end of the day, it will lead us to the theory of、uh, hegemony: who wins and who loses at the end. Is it something which is always taking place in international society? In certain cases. You might just want to lose in order to enjoy a benefit later. It might be a smarter way, so to try to get the hegemony by having a higher power may not be the approach chosen by certain countries. Those countries may think of cooperation and coordination, and that's the area where diplomacy works. So when we think of such relationship. After all, power theory such as soft power or smart power are not sufficient, especially in the field of education sectors.、Uh, the power theory may not be sufficient. Why is it the case in the field of education?、Uh, from the 1980s to 1990s, in theoretical.、Um, Discussion, dependency theory, or world system theory, where、uh, there are marginal peripheries and center, and knowledge in the center is brought to periphery, where it is consumed, and thus influence from the center. Uh, permeates uh, the peripheries, and so those countries, societies in the peripheries, often the case, become subservient to those in the center.、Uh, but I think that that structure is changing today. I will come to that point later.、Uh, Today, SDGs as a set of goal was adopted in 2015 by United Nations, and the kind of、uh, world view illustrated by SDGs 
is not really a relationship between the center and the periphery. Uh, rather, when knowledge is created, all the parties need to contribute to knowledge creation. And that seems to be very important for a sustainable society. In that sense, mutual relationship is very important. Competition, or rather, a struggle for power or hegemony, rather than that, a mutual relationship for cooperation and coordination is more important. In that sense, mutual respect and uh, accepting mutual cultures and traditions are very important. Uh, in promoting cross-cultural understanding, education play a very important role. When that happens, the rise of nationalism or increased radical violence around the world may be contained by promoting solidarity when education spreads and global education sector it may help deepen cross-cultural understanding or may reinforce mutual help relationship and eventually help stabilize the world so things are going really global. On a regional level, we are seeing effort towards harmonization. For example, if we look at Asia, in 2015, the ASEAN community was set up And uh, it took reference on the core concept of EU in building this ASEAN community, w which has three pillars. The ASEAN community itself, as you see in yellow, is an economic community above all. That is the greatest motivation. In other words, within Asia and South Asia, in Southeast Asia and ASEAN, the, the idea it was to get rid of tariffs. And uh, procurement of the materials uh, and the resources and production and sales. The total flow was to be completed within the region. And for that reason, the tariff was to be removed to facilitate this movement. And so economic benefit was, uh, above all, the main motivation in setting up this ASEAN community. But they also had another pillar, which was a social and uh, cultural community. ASEAN made up of 10 countries, is indeed very diverse. As a political system, uh, there are capitalist nations, socialist nations, unfortunately, uh, military dictatorship may also be seen, unfortunately. And uh, there is cultural diversity, Buddhist, Islam, Christian countries, there are minorities, smaller ethnic groups that exist in ASEAN. And at the same time, they wanted to create a regional identity even with that diversity. And therefore, uh, 
by having the ASEAN community, the sense of um, identity uh, was uh, promoted. In terms of political and uh, security, unfortunately, they were not able to build this community. For example, what is happening in Myanmar was not something that the uh, ASEAN community was able to resolve so easily as a community, and therefore, many initiatives uh, took place in terms of uh, fostering a community awareness for society and culture. For instance, of these uh, 10 countries, A promotion of joint educational system oh, had been discussed. ASEAN-ness uh, was something that, w that came about, which has been studied uh, by uh, many scholars in Japan as well, to see how this uh, ASEAN-ness has uh, been fostered as awareness. What is interesting is that in order to come up with this community, prior to 2015, within 10 countries of ASEAN, all elementary and secondary schools had all been open for 10 weeks in, in total. In other words, uh, the school years uh, were different, uh, school holidays were different among these uh, different, uh, in di 10 different countries, and therefore there was an initiative to try to come up with a joint school system and also uh, these school years were also different among different countries, and therefore within ASEAN, various Initiatives uh, were tried out in order to harmonize. And uh, that, I believe, is one of the results of knowledge dip diplomacy. So far, I, I think I have uh, talked uh, for more than 20 minutes, uh, perhaps, to discuss the basic concept and the framework that I would like to draw your attention to. From here, I go into the next session of my talk. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the points that I would like to raise today is international education cooperation. In 2015, the SDGs were adopted. And when we think about the era, of promoting SDGs, education plays an important role. For instance, the main role is uh, to develop uh, human resources who can contribute to global competition in terms of political, economic, and social cultural sense. And when they came up with the SDGs, education is found in goal number four. And in coming up with the SDGs in that process, uh, I was personally somewhat involved and we had much discussion. And uh, we discussed whether we needed to have a specific goal on education per se. Uh, prior to this, uh, we had 19 goals, and uh, in the process of uh, discussion over two years, uh, we discussed to reduce the goals to eight or ten. But all of these goals were related to very complicated uh, global issues, and therefore we ended up with 17, ultimately. And uh, we said at that time that perhaps uh, we don't need one goal for education, not because education is not important, it is because education is important. 
and uh, education plays a role in each of the goals. That was the idea. And uh, human resources development and research and the development of, let's say, for clean energy or uh, livable uh, cities. The research and development uh, would require education above all. And therefore, education is related to all of these goals, and therefore, why have a separate uh, uh, goal for education? That was the debate. And given that situation, but we said that education per se has its importance. And the requirement for education is related to the development of citizens who serve as actors in a democratic society. And that is where education plays a very important role. Education for society serve as a, an important pillar in that sense. I talked about the uh, 19th century uh, in the founding era of uh, uh, comparative education. The citizens of the modern state would run the city or the state independently. And in that process, we needed to educate citizens and people. But in that process, we also need to address the fact that education is a very complicated discipline because, as I already mentioned, it is related to identity building as a citizen of a certain country or an ethnic group. And in order to bring about that identity, we need education. I am a born Japanese, but it is not that uh, I was born Japanese and just uh, raised as a Japanese. I was educated as a Japanese and so that I would uh, uh, obtain that identity as a Japanese. And that was provided to me by formal education in schools. I think uh, that has been uh, discussed uh, quite extensively in the past as to how that is done. I could speak about this subject uh, one or two hours uh, if needed, that it is a very important su subject. Going back to 1990s, when I started to engage in um, education in the developing countries, when I was a graduate student, student, many teachers and professors uh, told me that without uh, understanding history, uh, the past history of what Japan has done, we should not be uh, um, tackling this uh, um, education issue so easily without understanding fully what Japanese and Japanese have done uh, to the developing countries in the past. In the post-war era, uh, Japan has uh, developed, but uh, when uh, supporting uh, and aiding uh, developing countries, Ministry of Education in those uh, days uh, discussed as to what should be done. And uh, Ministry of Education officials were sent uh, to the Asian countries to f see what Japanese, Japan as a developed country could do in providing support to the developing countries in Asia in terms of education. It was a very sensitive issue, and uh, it was found out that uh, in those uh, early post-war era, it was determined that it was too early to engage in such projects because uh, the these countries did not have good feelings toward Japan in those days yet. And Dr. Yasuo Saito uh, has written a lot about this history, so I would urge you to read uh, his uh, writings and books uh, if you're interested uh, in this topic. And I look back uh, to my early years as a researcher 
or still a graduate student. When I went to the United States, after that, of course, I fled Japan, perhaps in a sense, being told by my professors that、uh, I should not、uh, think so easily about、uh, promoting Japanese style education in、uh, developing Asian countries. But when we look at the West and、uh, the UK, perhaps there was a relationship、uh, of the UK with the Commonwealth countries, which relationship may be different、uh, from that of、uh, Japan versus、uh, the developing countries in Asia. And、uh, the comparative education studies in Japan, in that sense,、uh, became quite a unique discipline because of that. From the 1990s, the developing countries、uh, in Asia themselves said to Japan that. That、uh, they don't think uh, Japan uh, is uh, trying to engage in cultural imperialism anymore, and Japan is a major ODA donor country, and therefore, as recipients of uh, ODAs, uh, they wanted and asked Japan to support them, and so the Minister of Education officials coordinated、uh, with the. Developing countries、uh, to engage in development aid and assistance. Since then, first、uh, they started with building of schools and uh, supporting uh, uh, science-related、uh, and math-related subjects, but now it has become wider. I just want to, you to understand that there is a historical background to what we have been doing、um, today with Edgeport. It is a, not an ODA; it is a mixed project, Ministry of Education project, and it is not provided、uh, to support and assist、uh, developing countries. But actually, in Edgeport project,、uh, there are cases、uh, where the Recipients are developing countries、uh, or JICA、uh, may also be involved, but、uh, please understand that、uh, Edgeport is、uh, something that is uh, uh, to done totally differently from what we have been doing in the past. I think、uh, there are two main categories in international education cooperation. One is intellectual exchange, especially. Um, in the universities,、uh, we have、uh, intellectual exchange, and、uh, we have equal partnership. It is、uh, a two-way exchange in terms of knowledge transfer. And over twenty years,、uh, I have been、uh, discussing things、uh, with uh, Cambodian uh, researchers, uh, which is uh, uh, one type of intellectual exchange. Another category is development assistance,、uh, mainly carried out、uh, through o- official development assistance (ODA), and、uh, this is a donor-recipient、uh, relationship、uh, mainly. And the, but, and so in terms of that, it is not、uh, truly equal, perhaps. Of course, international education cooperation was a phased.、Uh, Phased a、uh, uh, project, and of course, initially there might be a donor-recipient relationship, but、uh, ultimately、uh, they would、uh, change. The horizontal axis is、uh, the receiving of the、uh, benefits from partners, and the vertical axis is、uh, granting of benefits、uh, from partners. The question is who is mainly responsible, and、uh, who re- 
benefits mostly uh, from this cooperation. When we think about these details, a vertical relationship, a ODA, a horizontal relationship, intellectual exchange, it is not that simple. Uh, there are other types of intellectual exchange uh, that is uh, being promoted, uh, which I have named intellectual development cooperation. This is a new model that uh, is being promoted in international cooperation. Mutual efforts is the key word here. The, the developing countries, uh, developed countries, both would give mutual efforts in this new form of international cooperation. In Japan, we have satraps, and in the United States, uh, there's a similar program called a PEER. And uh, what this does is the JICA-based ODA and JSD, Japan Science and Technology Agency, which is a Magster affiliated uh, organization, uh, which uh, pro is a funding agency for promoting R&D. And JSD and JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, and the MEXT and uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, form a partnership to work with developing countries to engage in global uh, topics and to start with research. It, they don't start with assistance, but start with research instead because Climate change, for instance, which, or biodiversity, such a, a global challenges are occurring globally, crossing borders, and in some cases, the challenge may be greater in the developing countries, which mean that uh, practitioners and researchers in developing countries uh, may be facing these uh, global challenges more keenly and uh, may be more knowledgeable, therefore, about these challenges. And therefore, rather than going straight to uh, provide assistance uh, in the form of ODA to tackle such uh, global challenges, it may be more... Uh, promising uh, to uh, work on research together and in solving the challenges ODA may be provided. And in this process, indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge may be utilized. In dealing with SDGs, I think uh, this sort of uh, thinking is uh, being promoted not only looking at uh, the developed countries and developing countries as a vertical relationship, uh, but uh, um, trying to uh, transform that relationship more towards a horizontal relationship with equal part as an equal partner. It may be different from innovation, but I think in terms of uh, global farmers, uh, they are sending many uh, Western uh, farmers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, are sending uh, their uh, researchers uh, to developing countries uh, to collect uh, traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge uh, from these developing uh, countries. And traditional uh, medicine uh, may not be so effective after all, but in some cases uh, they uh, may turn out to be quite effective when turned into global medicine. And, uh, uh, such, uh, in, uh, there may be ingredients uh, that may, that may not be readily developed uh, in a lab. So the relationship between developed countries and developing countries, uh, would require more equal partnership. And as a result of that, the educational models that we are discussing today may be 
uh, utilized uh, in a better way when developing countries uh, bring in educational models uh, from the developed countries. But what we need to be cautious there is that developing uh, countries have their own local uh, context and uh, local history. And uh, the question is how well they understand that local context uh, in bringing in uh, models uh, from abroad. I discussed the terms adaptation and appropriation. Appropriation um, is a step towards the localization. And for that to happen, local history and local context uh, needs to be well understood uh, by the recipient as well. Uh, I'd like to share with you one example. This is what I studied earlier. And uh, uh, Dr. Hagaya of Ritzmanka University and uh, a researcher, uh, Professor O'Clock, uh, at the time working in the Ministry of Environment in Cambodia, and I worked on this particular theme concerning Cambodia. So what happened in Cambodia is as follows. Uh, from 1975 to 1979, as you know, the country was ruled uh, by Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge regime, uh, which carried out a major massacre. And uh, in that country, it named Democratic Kampuchea at the time. Uh, first, Khmer culture was denied. Traditional Kumail culture was totally denied and intellectuals were killed and many people died or they fled to other countries. So uh, the society at the time lost their traditional culture. Then at the end of 1975, with the support of Vietnam, another force ousted Pol Pot and established a new country, People's Republic of Cambodia. And in 1990s, the current Cambodia was formed. From 1980s to 1990s, they had a civil war, but they were under socialist regime. And I became involved in Cambodia and their studies uh, in 2000 and later. In 1980s, their culture was destroyed, and in the 1980s, they lost themselves because of the strong Vietnamization. In the 1990s, the current Kingdom of Cambodia was established when traditional Kumel culture revived, and that was a story told over and over again. But in the 1980s, so-called the era of Vietnamization, not just Vietnamization, but also there were efforts for re kumerization that is to revive Kumel culture, but that fact was more or less forgotten by Cambodian people. But when you analyze textbooks used in those days, we understand the reality. And that is clear from uh, the textbooks they used. Uh, when Cambodia became a socialist country, the leadership of socialist country denied uh, socialist Cambodia, democratic Cambodia, but uh, they then began to promote the recumulization to remember the traditional culture they have had. In the 1980s, they had education that respected the traditional education, but when the current uh, Kingdom of Cambodia was formed, they denied what was educated in the previous country. And they had forgotten that Kumail culture was 
restricted back in those days. So that was a relatively clear-cut process Cambodian people went through. So when a government or regime change dramatically, the new regime tend to deny what was taught in the previous regime, and that is often repeated whenever the country's system change. And in the process, people began to think what was the core elements of their identity. And that, I think, is one of the themes when comparative education scholars analyzed such a country's history. When you try to bring a new educational model to such a country, then we shouldn't negate or forget the process they went through. Rather, in the process of appropriation, we need to consider what needs to be kept and what should be brought about. Newly, when an educational model is to be brought into that country, I don't know if this is the right way, but this is something I felt when I learned the history of education in Cambodia. Now, uh, next section or next part is the most important part of my talk, that is overseas development of uh, Japanese-style education. I don't have uh, uh, many slides on Edgeport so far, but from here I'd like to speak about Japanese-style education and its overseas development. So as a kind of uh, development of what I argued so far, I'd like to speak of Japanese-style education. I'm sure that uh, the audience already know to some extent what are the specific features of Japanese style education if you have attended the series of web seminars so far. And this is a list of Japanese style education characteristics and some good characteristics. So, the potential recipient of Japanese-style educational model would like to utilize such good practices and improve upon their own education system. And on the other hand, Japan side may also would like to learn in that process. And what is often said is knowledge and ethics and the healthy body needs to be well balanced and need to be developed together to grow uh, independent citizens, which are the important uh, bearers of democratic society. That's an often said important uh, purpose of Japanese-style education. In some countries, knowledge and the uh, sound body may be considered in more important than uh, emphasis on ethics. Some may be leaning toward knowledge. And I think there are quite a few number of countries whose education places relatively high emphasis on knowledge and skills. Uh, I often speak of your own reflection in the mirror. In Edgeport Japan initiative is useful not only for uh, the partner countries, but through such a process, Japan side can also look at their own image in the reflection, although they don't usually see it. And I think that's one significant implication or benefits we can get on the part of Japan and Japanese. And port of Asia port relates to 
export on the part of Japan and import on the part of the recipient partner. And that has been a criticism given to Export Japan a program. And I wouldn't say that there aren't no such elements of export and import. And Professor Kan Suzuki, a professor in Tokyo University and uh, also served as a vice minister of education. And Professor Suzuki began to speak of from port to port. Port is where many things come together, and that's an element she often emphasizes. Speaking of Asia port, when people gather, uh, there emerge needs. Because people want to do something, a group of people gather in one place. And Japanese style education spread in some countries because there were some needs. For instance, lesson study. United States, especially Professor Kathleen Lewis, learned of lesson study and she introduced that practice in the United States. And it was a equal relationship. What was done in Japan was brought into the United States on an equal basis. And lesson study seemed to have met unmet needs in many other countries and that's how lesson study expanded around the world. And this shows the three purposes of Egypt Japan. Uh, and you may suspect that there are some Japanese national interests considered. And I cannot deny that because it was promoted uh, by Minister of Education. And certainly there are some Japanese national interests as important agenda of this project. And as Professor Takayama mentioned, uh, from uh, the preparatory stage, I was engaged in Asia Japan. And I have always had some concern about this national interest elements of Asia Japan. And I myself believe that such a project doesn't just benefit Japan, but also a benefit to other countries. And I believe that that must be realized by designing Expo Japan in a certain way. And this leads me to the notion of knowledge diplomacy. And I believe that knowledge diplomacy is a very important idea when we think of what Expo Japan tries to achieve. And that is what I emphasize when I discuss with bureaucrats of Minister of Education and uh, those people in the Minister of Education now consider knowledge diplomacy as a very important aspect of Asia Port Japan. Then uh, I think you can look at various concrete examples of Asia Port Japan uh, projects and one a very successful case was a instrumental music education by Yamaha Corporation. And, and such instrumental music education or physical education were not actually done in some develop developing countries and the students didn't have an opportunity to uh, play such uh, musical instruments such as recorder. And that is a kind of musical instrument, very cheap and easy to learn. And Yamaha Corporation uh, brought about this instrumental music education in Vietnam and also in Egypt. And this instrumental music education uh, is very well received by uh, people educators in Vietnam and in Egypt. And children really enjoy this uh, musical education. And this 
instrumental musical education is now part of the national education standard. And of course, on the part of Yamaha Corporation, if、uh, this education spreads around the world, they can enjoy a good business sales of their musical instruments. But of course, things are not that simple. In usual cases,、uh, not their musical instruments, rather cheap、uh, equivalents of their musical instruments made somewhere else may be introduced in their musical education. But when such an instrumental musical education increases in the quality, then Those countries may want to buy higher quality musical instruments from Yamaha Corporation and then they might be able to enjoy good benefits. Another example is the vocational education to train automobile mechanics. In this case,、uh, that is an education to train students In automobile mechanics skills. But beyond this, in the case of Myanmar, they and the Myanmar government are discussing whether this could lead to a national certification of skill program. And what we see as a common element between the two examples is that In the education field, such education is practiced day by day, but at the same time, they bring it to the national level and connect to the formation of national standards or certification program. And the Minister of Education would like to further promote such projects. When we transplant or transfer education model, what does it really mean? There are difficulties involved in transplanting educational models, whether we talk about borrowing or lending, whatever form it takes. In case of、uh, a borrowing, uh, Or lending, the forms may differ, but in any case, we need to give importance on the local history and、uh, the sense of values. This is the、uh, classroom cleaning period、uh, in the Filipino school, elementary school. Regarding tokatsu, for instance, much study is being done by Professor Tsuneyoshi, Professor Hiroko Tsuneyoshi, and、uh, when they went to Singapore, they realized or saw that although、uh, classroom、uh, cleaning Uh, thought was uh, uh, brought in, they might、uh, tidy up the tables and、uh, clean the tables, but uh, they thought that、uh, the cleaning of the floor uh, was uh, something that the janitor takes care of and not by school children. And so This is not the kind of classroom cleaning or school cleaning uh, that uh, is being done in Jap- Japanese schools. Janitors、uh, can serve as teachers for how best to clean a space. And,、uh, The same thing could happen elsewhere、uh, when local cultures are different. For example, a schoolmaster in, or headmaster in Finland
was outraged when he, 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 uh, the schoolmaster or headmaster saw uh, children cleaning the classrooms, saying that it was a child labor. And uh, you may be sued in Finland. When we conduct something such as Eduport, we need to be mindful of the local context of that country. In case of Egypt, which is uh, quite active in trying to introduce Japanese-style education, but in that background, perhaps there may be, it may be the case that discipline and the development of disciplined citizens may be considered as being beneficial uh, to the current uh, political system in Egypt because uh, disciplined citizens may be more obedient to what the government has to say. And when we try to transplant Japanese-style education, tokkatsu in itself may be good, but is causing the teachers uh, to work much overtime and make teachers busy as a result of this. So although the idea is good and fine, on the other hand, Tokkatsu may be making the teachers so busy. And uh, we may be also transplanting that business uh, uh, of the teachers uh, to other countries as well. If we brought a tokkatsu as is to the, to these different countries. And, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, government, uh, engaged in, uh, legal support in Cambodia, for instance, and uh, as a sense, as a, a similar example of borrowing, um, in uh, building the civil law in Cambodia, uh, the traces of uh, the patriarchal household system was also brought in without knowing from Japan to Cambodia, and therefore adjustment need to be made, needed to be made in that case, and also. When we think about this issue, what is and what could be said to be a good practice? Uh, how we look at academic achievement or education. The Japanese uh, holistic uh, education approach may be good in one sense, but at the same time, there may be challenges at the same time. And I think when uh, Japan tries to export or transplant the Japanese system elsewhere, I think it gives an opportunity uh, to the Japanese themselves about what they have been doing when they go to OECD and UNESCO and other international fora to discuss this matter. And uh, regarding the international debate, when we think about what specifically is Japanese, There are aspects where Japan is con uh, contributing in the uh, this debate in international fora, such as OECD and UNESCO, but it may not be sufficient at the, at the moment. And uh, in that sense, uh, Eduport, for instance, uh, may be able to make up for that in terms of additional contribution and to provide various lessons. Although we talk about the Japanese style, there are a lot of discussions in UNESCO and in OECD 
And uh, in Japan, uh, we have uh, revised uh, the guidelines uh, for the course of study, and there may be similarities, commonalities, and differences. And the question is, how could we identify them? And uh, what does Edgeport make possible? Professor Takayama talked about uh, the symposium which took place last week. And uh, Edgeport Nippon 2.0 is uh, uh, something that is uh, in our mind. I personally think that we need to think uh, more seriously about international education in the 21st century. And ultimately, academic uh, uh, findings and actual practice uh, may be brought closer together in a more harmonious way. It is not a conclusion as such, but uh, I have spent quite a lot of time uh, speaking about my thoughts today. I would like to end there. Thank you very much.